this year's ASCO Public Service Award. Dr. Pazder is here to discuss several forward-looking and important advances in drug review and approval. Rick? Thank you, Bruce, for the introduction. Um, as I was coming into the convention hall, I was thinking back to my first ASCO meeting, and I'm the oldest panel member, and that was in 1980, okay? ASCO was a very different organization at that time. In fact, the, um, the convention was held in a single hotel, believe it or not. Uh, I practiced here, or I was in, did my training here in Chicago. I'm a Chicago native, so I welcome you to the city. But oncology in Chicago was a tremendously different paradigm from what it is now. There was only a handful of medical oncologists. Uh, in fact, the medical school that I graduated at, Loyola, uh, I was listening to a lecture I remember very vividly, and uh, the lecturer, the pharmacology lecturer said, we are very blessed to have a medical oncologist, a single medical oncologist on staff in 1980. Now they have well over 40 or 50 in a large cancer center. So the field of oncology has changed tremendously. And I wanted to ch share with you some of the changing paradigms in really oncology drug development and drug regulation uh, that has occurred over that period of time. Here's a list of drugs that were approved in 2011, 2012, and 2013. And the reasons why I'm showing this is to just say drug development in oncology is alive and well. In, 19, in 2012, rather, uh, 14 new molecular entities were approved, and these included new molecular entities and new biologics. This represented 40% of all drugs that were approved in the United States. So here again, I think we could say that oncology is alive and well, uh, and the development of these drugs is proceeding in an orderly manner. Uh, are we ready to claim victory? Uh, of course we're not. There's tremendous needs for improvement. But getting back to that original ASCO meeting, I remember a time when the only drug that we had to treat colon cancer was 5-FU. I remember a time when the only drug that we had for CML was hydroxyurea and it was a death sentence. I remember a time where the only drug to treat multiple myeloma uh, well, was chlorambucil and now we have multiple agents. Uh, there's a tremendous in wealth uh, and growth of drugs that have occurred uh, during this period of time. Um, the important thing also about this list, these are the initial approvals of these drugs, and generally these approvals occur in very refract refractory diseases. Uh, these drugs will go on to be studied further in earlier stages of the diseases that they were approved in, and in addition to that, they will seek other indications in other oncology diseases. The major obstacles to oncology drug approvals and the major obstacles to the development of drugs in oncology has been the demonstration of efficacy. Our drugs have a unique toxicity and risk benefit that is not shared by other therapeutic areas in the agency. Uh, but since we are dealing with life-threatening disease, we have a much greater tolerance toward uh, a different safety profile and a different risk-benefit profile. But here again, the major hurdle for most oncology drugs that we've seen over this 30-year period of time has been the demonstration of efficacy. With a more thorough understanding of the diseases and matching the drugs to these diseases, we have witnessed advances. And behind these numbers, I want to illustrate some specific examples that are demonstrated on this slide. As I mentioned before, you know, melanoma 30 years ago basically had no disease. In fact, 10 years ago had or had no drugs. Ten, ten years ago, it had no drugs. And just this past week, on Wednesday, we approved two drugs for the treatment of melanoma. And this was the 
this, uh, these two approvals represented four new drugs that were approved in the last two years. We've seen activities in common diseases, such as prostate cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer, defining these diseases more accurately with molecular subtyping, both on HER2 new status in breast cancers with the approval of pertuzumab uh, and TDM1 or uh, uh, adotrastuzumab uh, emantacine. Uh, we've seen lung cancer basically be redefined uh, by molecular subtypes. We've seen diseases that had no drugs or very little therapeutic activity have drugs approved in it, such as myelofibrosis. We've seen activity in drugs such as Hodgkin's lymphoma, where there hasn't been any uh, really intense new drug or new drugs uh, approved with the w until the approval of brentuximab. Again, in multiple myeloma, multiple drugs being improved to transform uh, the disease. So patients that have multiple myeloma, CML renal cell cancer, and even melanoma are experiencing uh, an improved quality of life and also uh, improved length of life. This has been associated with an era of personalized medicine, and I pointed out here some of the drugs and the relationship to the companion diagnosis, uh, companion diagnostics, rather, that have been approved with these drugs. Uh, and this is still going to be, I think, a very active area and further work on these biomarkers to select what is the appropriate population to optimize a risk-benefit uh, 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 evaluation is what is needed here, and this will continue in the following years. From a regulatory perspective, we've recognized that the field of oncology is changing and therefore that the regulation of drugs in oncology must change, and one of our recent uh, regulatory initiatives has been the designation of breakthrough therapies that have occurred uh, with recent passage of FADAGA. Uh, breakthrough therapies basically, uh, is, the designation of breakthrough therapy is designated when there is preliminary clinical evidence that a drug may demonstrate a substantial improvement over existing therapy. This is a much higher bar than fast track or accelerated approval or priority review. Uh, in fact, by the word substantial improvement, my own interpretation of this word is for these breakthrough therapies, really what we're looking for is really transformative therapies, therapies that are really going to offer patients an option where no other therapy existed or are a dramatic improvement that looks like they're really going to transform the course of the patient's life, both the quality of that life and the quantity of that life. But what does breakthrough therapy really mean, and how is it different? And I think that this has not been um, well expressed, and I really do want to spend some time on what, what does this breakthrough designation mean. Well, what does it mean? It really means that the agency is going to spend a considerable amount of time working with sponsors in a very iterative fashion uh, to really accelerate the drug development, to, to work with the sponsor on a step-by-step -step and sometimes on a monthly basis with teleconference and improved communication to ensure that the package that is submitted will be able to be expedited in the review system, that patients in randomized studies uh, that are randomized to a control arm will be minimized if there is really preliminary evidence that the study that, uh, the, the drug that is being uh, investigated truly represents a breakthrough in that disease. So it's really a different pattern and a different uh, really communication structure uh, and working relationship with the sponsor. Uh, the traditional, for those of you that are not familiar with the regulatory system, we have standard regulatory meetings with sponsors, end of phase two meetings, pre-IND meetings. And with this process, these meetings are not going to be landmark meetings, but much more of a continuous dialogue with sponsors, looking at what preliminary and ongoing results are. And frequently, this may require change in regulatory advice, looking at different endpoints, even changing endpoints, looking at the enrollment on a trial, and even downsizing potentially some trials if the efficacy appears to be greater than previously expected. So it's a different way of looking and working with our pharmaceutical uh, uh, sponsors uh, in drug regulation. 
This requires, obviously, some changes not only for the FDA, but also for the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, most of us are very familiar with the clinical trials that go into place in drug review, but when an application comes to the FDA, it's not only the clinical trial, but a complete package which includes manufacturing. And those manufacturing process, uh, processes also must be escalated or uh, rapidly evolving with the clinical trials to ensure that they are ready when we are ready to approve the drug. I'd lastly like to end with some of the collaborative ventures we've had with ASCO and other professional groups throughout the years. Uh, Sandy already mentioned the neoadjuvant work, a breast cancer workshop that was conducted uh, with ASCO and other professional groups. Uh, we've also had several uh, workshops looking at minimal residual disease as a potential regulatory endpoint in ALL, AML, and CLL. We've recently this month had a prostate cancer and a bladder cancer workshop held uh, in San Diego with the American Urological Association. We have an ongoing program with ASCO, AACR, and NCI, and Duke Cancer Center uh, looking at uh, a teaching program to ensure that young investigators understand the regulatory principles and how to optimize uh, clinical trials to ensure uh, a timely outcome of these trials. We've recently had a ODAC chair meetings. We have international outreach with our regulatory partners, both Health Canada and the EMA, on a monthly basis uh, to discuss ongoing applications. And in fact, at this meeting, we'll be having a separate meeting with the EMA and Health Canada to discuss uh, regulatory issues and applications that are before us. And in addition to this, we have an ongoing program when we approve a drug to notify ASCO membership of that approval and the appropriate link to the product label. I, I really thank ASCO. Uh, this has been a terrific 33 years for me, and I hope to continue for 33 more years, <laughs> just kidding there. Uh, but uh, I appreciate the award that you gave me and uh, I've always hel held the organization in a very high esteem. Thank you very much, Sandy and Cliff.